you get to a point of life that, that you have to think about what is the purpose of your life? Like, what do you really do in your life? Okay, so I was born in Japan. I was given proper education, and I was fortunate enough to travel to see those reality of the world. And what can I use those experience? How can I use those experience to or make myself useful for you know for for others or for for society or I, I always think about like you know yeah it's just life is so unfair welcome back to the podcast today we have a very special guest she is an artist writer and the founder of love the way a creator of inspirational and motivational content in art form Love the Way offers calligraphic, Asian-inspired abstract art created to inspire and encourage everyone to embrace their unique life journey. These inspirations for her art included the beauty of nature, the mystery of the universe, and words of wisdom that transcend time and space. Originally from Japan, she earned a bachelor's degree in bioethics at Waseda University in Tokyo and a master's degree in political science from California State University. She's a self-taught artist and uses mixed medium and acrylic color on canvas. She sets in motion her career as a part-time artist in 2006 by selling customized pieces while working as a political journalist. What began as a sporadic commission work transpired into a blooming art studio, bringing to life the concepts that served as her inspirations. She has, she's had a showing at art galleries in Modesto and San Francisco and at a major art show, including Sacramento Art Festival, the Saratoga Rotary Art Show, and Art and Craft Festivals in Oakland. She has donated a number of pieces to various fundraiser events at schools and charity organizations and offered commission work for special occasions such as wedding, newborn babies, and graduations as well. She is currently based in Santa Cruz, which offers beautiful nature where she enjoys running, backpacking, and spiritual exploration. Please welcome to the podcast, Miss Haruko de Arth. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. And by the way, uh, this is an exciting podcast because it's the first podcast back in studio. We've been gone in Hawaii for a long time, but we're back now and we have an amazing guest today. So, um, you know, we always like to start the podcast with kind of getting to know the person. Because uh, I feel that if they get to know you and your story, they can connect with you better. So you were born in Japan, born and raised in Japan. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about that. Uh, what part of Japan, you know, how long were you there for? Tell us a little well, bit about that. Well, I'm, I'm a Japanese native. I was born and raised in Japan, uh, lived until late 20s. So, okay. yeah. Um, uh, so I'm from... Uh, the town of Kofu, which is about 100 miles west of Tokyo. It's kind of like a foothill town of Mount Fuji that people okay. probably know about. Oh, so Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji, yeah. yeah I yeah. was able to see the, the top of Mount Fuji from my window from my parents' house. Oh, really? Yeah. That must have been cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a country, like a mixture of, of a modern uh, city with... Uh, tons of nature around so mm -hmm. it's a really nice place to so i have a question mount fuji is that a volcano yeah it's volcanic but that it's dormant it's dormant oh okay so it's not active <laughs> yeah okay so you said you grew up west of, of tokyo yeah it's okay. about 100 miles uh away from tokyo so it's like um uh it's not quite commute commutable distance yeah. but a lot of people um live in a, a kofu and if, when i visit my parents um, and has a business in Tokyo. I don't have to stay in Tokyo. Actually, I just, you know, take a train, uh, not a boat, boat train, like express train. Right. And it takes only an hour and a half okay. to get to Kofu. So, so you're an hour and a half outside of Tokyo by train. Okay. So tell us a little bit about growing up. So you, you, you don't say Mount Fuji. How do you pronounce it? Mount Fuji. Fuji. Okay. So that's how the Japanese pronounce it. It's mm -hmm. Fuji. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you All know right. the apple, Fuji apple? Yeah, that's Fuji actually Apple. come from Fuji, Mount Fuji. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a brand name. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're one of my favorite apples, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really flavorful. So Mount Fuji or, or Fuji, mm -hmm. uh, the apples come from there, and it's also the dormant volcano. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. you grew up in, the, in what was it, uh, town, Kofu? Kofu, town nearby, like a foothill town. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's... it's uh, 
it's it's a city um, surrounded by a lot of mountain actually. That sep- the mountain separates from big city of Tokyo and Kofu. So I wasn't raised in a, like a big city like a Tokyo. So it's more uh, laid back countryside and um, yeah. But you know, I was raised in a mixture of traditional Japanese culture and uh, economic prosperity of modern Japan. Um, okay. My yeah, my parents are really into education, and um, yeah. yeah, I pretty much did everything uh, what my parents expected <laughs> me yeah. to do. Like, yeah. you know, I did sports, and then I got involved in like student councils, and um, but I always wanted to, uh, you know, as a child, I look around those mountain right in in uh, surrounding the city, and uh, I was always wondering what's out there beyond those mountains. And then in Japan, of course, it's a, a country of, of island. So I was won- wondering what's out there outside the country out of the ocean. So it's like I was always dreaming about. Uh, of course, I didn't know at that time that, that I, I'm going to be moving to the United States yeah. <laughs> later on in my life or uh, traveling around the world. But yeah, I was always curious about different culture and different countries. Yeah, so you grew up surrounded by mountains. So did you visit Tokyo often as a kid? Not or much. Were you, okay, not much. Mm-hmm. So how long did you spend in, in your town until you kind of started to venture out a little until bit? Until I graduated high school. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I moved on to uh, college in Tokyo. That's how I moved out okay. of the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like most kids, like college, would get out. Yeah, yes, get out. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to get out, right? Yeah. yeah. In my own life and exploring the world, so the college days is very exciting. Um, uh, yeah, basically, I got involved a a, a lot of volunteering activities because I was really curious about uh, what's happening in the world, and then I volunteered at the nonprofit organization, providing uh, like aid and assistance for the refugees or the um, uh, war-torn countries. Mm -hmm. And that organization actually uh, provided humanitarian aid to many African countries and Asian countries. So um, I took an an opportunity to volunteers to work uh, in a refugee camp in Croatia. Uh, th- where we have a, a lot of um, refugees from Bosnia. Oh, you wow. know, back in 1995, yeah. in the summer, um, the country of former Yugoslavia was uh, in problem, like, yeah. you know, uh, uh, at war. We actually had a guest who survived the genocide of the Bosnian-Croatian uh, War, or uh, the oh. Bosnian-Serbian War okay. in the 90s. She was on the show oh, wow. a couple shows ago, right? Really? Yeah. Yeah, you guys should check that episode out. Um, but she was talking about it. She survived that whole oh thing that goodness. happened. So you were actually helping out those refugees mm-hmm. that were going. They were going a lot of them to Japan, or you went to Bosnia and helped out. I I went to Bosnia. I, I went to the Croatia, oh, okay. where the Bosnian refugees are staying. Right, right, Croatia. I'm sorry. Yeah. So she was. Yeah. So you went to Croatia because that's where a lot of the Bosnian refugees mm-hmm. went. Okay. Wow. Yeah. How old were you when that when you went over there to to volunteer? I was I was a, just a college student volunteer for summer oh wow uh, kind of like an internship almost mm-hmm. um i was part of the um program in, uh, provided by the local non-profit organization mm-hmm. um because there's a lot of children's um in the camp but they weren't provided uh formal educations mm-hmm. so the the local non-profit organization are providing the educational activities and the recreational activities for the kids, uh, the grade schools to the high school. So basically, I was, uh, you know, me and two other volunteers from one from America and one from uh, Denmark, actually, oh, wow, got okay. together and yeah. um, basically played with the kids. <laughs> um, did a lot of sports, basketball and soccer. And, nice. it, and the camp was really... Uh, camp was set up in a really nice location nearby the beach where it used to be like a vacation uh, destination for the people uh, in Croatia. Um, So each family, both Indian families are uh, given like an RV type of um, 
know, accommodation. Okay. And then yeah. they were staying there. By the time that I was there, they were been living in that camp for over three years. Wow. That's a long time for yeah. not being able to go home or mm -hmm. not being able to um, have a, you know, job or pursue a career or kids uh, going to school. That's a really difficult situation. So uh, while I was there, only a short time, I really saw what's the real impact of conflict or war right. to the people's life on yeah. a day to day basis. And that was probably one of the worst wars to hit Europe since World War Two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't really see like actual like killing or yeah. genocide or the bomb dropping or anything yeah. like that. But that it's just uh how 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 profoundly impacting people's life because you know you you have no hope like yeah you, you lost everything you lost the house you lost you fled from town and then you lost to my family members and then yeah. it's really difficult for parents to raise children so um yeah that experience really got me think uh like what i really want to do in my life or mm -hmm. as a uh, you know what kind of career I want to pursue. So uh, it made me think about, all right, I want to get involved in a nonprofit um, mm -hmm. humanitarian aid work uh, where I can directly uh, like involved in and then assist um, those people who is in need. Yeah, so you, you basically kind of found a passion for helping that type of cause yeah. through that. Yeah. I mean, that was probably pretty impactful to be, you know, a young Japanese woman, you know, first time leaving. Well, you already left because you went to Tokyo, right? Mm -hmm. But first time leaving your country mm -hmm. after growing up surrounded by mountains. Well, I actually, by the time, uh, that was my senior in high uh, in college. Okay. So I already traveled through different countries. Okay. Bef you know, as my sophomore year and a junior year i've been to the united states oh, okay. uh, took a language class and yeah. uh, so i was uh, i was i was comfortable enough to travel around by yeah. myself and explore and then experience and instead of pursuing my career uh in the big Japanese corporation like everybody else did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I decided to take that uh, opportunities to work in the uh, refugee camp, but that actually helped me to find my passion. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So so why did you not choose the big Japanese corporation and why did you choose to do the volunteer work? Mm, not sure. Um, I it, it just, you know, Working for like a mega bank or corporate Japan or maybe government um, mm -hmm. didn't really um, resonate with me. The idea working for those um, like a successful career path didn't right. really um, uh, attractive to me. Or I thought that there was something else going on in the world that, right. that people are not really paying much attention or... Um, Maybe there is a there's a people who are neglected, or mm -hmm. there's a people who can only um, left with the option to get help to get their feet on the ground, like or you know start with. Right. So um, you kind of wanted something bigger, yeah, like a bigger like a, purpose. Like a, yeah, maybe, maybe I just wanted to. Of course, you know. Uh, if you work for the corporation, if you work for the government, you can still contribute to the society. You of know, course, the yeah. good course, and everybody doing in their own place. But um, to me, at the time, nonprofit, working for nonprofit, or maybe you know, maybe like a, something like a United Nations or right, Doctors yeah. Without Borders, that right. kind of, uh, would be my path. And then it's actually a professional career path. Right. So I wanted to pursue that. Yeah. So I'm just curious because um, let's go back to when you were like a child and growing up in close to Mount Fuji. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was there any certain things that happened to you like when you were young that made you kind of more like have that ha that heart to help people or, you know, d did anything happen like when you were younger or, or was it just maybe because you grew up kind of in the small countryside town, you wanted to see the world a little bit more you just wanted to see what the world was about because you did grow up in the small town R right um i think um there's a few things maybe uh that maybe um 
that I can touch upon. When I was in maybe third grade or fourth grade, um, uh, I went to the library and they were are ask for asking for donations for um, helping out the Cambodian boat people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that this that was like a back in nineteen eighties, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, after the Vietnam War, a lot of boat people from Vietnam, Cambodia, fleeing to the United States. Remember those times? And there's a lot of Cambodian refugees uh, settling down in the United States. And there's a lot of people also came to Japan. And th they are asking for donations to help out those people. And then I have no idea what's the refugee or what's the yeah. boat people. So maybe that's the first, very first time that, that I was introduced yeah. to Kind of planted the seed in yeah, your head. I think yeah. so. And then also, um, I read the book of um, uh, Dr. Schweitzer. Uh, do you know that um, he, he's the one who discovered the one of the uh, uh, transmittable diseases in Africa, um, yellow fever? Okay. I'm not quite sure. I can't remember. But that I read about his uh, bibli bibliography and... Um, He's a doctor who kind of devoted his life to help the people in Africa. He's from Germany, but that he, you know, instead of uh, seeing his patient in uh, Germany or going through his career path in a big hospital in a, a developing country, he decided to um, go where uh, the total lack of resources, medical and healthcare yeah, like resources. Really poor third world third country. Third world countries, yeah. Um, so I was a little, really inspire, inspired by, by those people who dedicate their life for um, for someone who pretty much nothing to do with you or not your family, not friend, but that right. a fellow humans, right. um, regardless where they're from. And I was very, yeah, like, Curious and also inspired. Right. Maybe those are the one, like you know, maybe I can think of too. Okay. Yeah. And so, did did you grow up as the only child, or did you have siblings? I have siblings. Okay. I'm the I'm the oldest, and then I have a uh, sister two years younger than me, and my brother seven years younger than me. Oh wow! Yeah. So so I'm the oldest too. So I kind of underst I kind of feel you on that one. So what was it like being the oldest of uh, of your family? Was it a lot more responsibility, like? Uh, what was that like being the oldest, especially uh -huh. the oldest girl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. You know, Japan, I think my parents' generations are, they're pretty conservative. You know, they want to raise children and uh, they expect kids to go to the good college and, and get a job at the good company. Uh, yeah. And just kind of, a, you know. But my parents actually always encouraged me to, um, like, pursue my passion. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? So... Uh, some of my friend, uh, the parents are saying like, well, as a woman, you know, you don't want, I don't want you to go to the Tokyo. I don't want yeah. you to go out, the, uh, leave the home. And yeah. then, there's such a restriction on, on their life. And then uh, my parents never really said that. And then I'm sure as a mother <laughs> of two children now, I can assure that, that how my parents were feeling about when I said that I'm going to go to the Bosnia, to, you know, to yeah. volunteer <laughs> in the yeah. country in, uh, under the war. Um, but even then, my parents kind of uh, understood, like, I'm just following my passion yeah. and I need to figure it out. I need to explore. And then they thought that, it, well, stopping won't do any good yeah. to me. So they just pray for my safety and <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. I'm forever thankful for that. Yeah, that's very rare actually that parents support their kids' passions, especially, especially with dangerous I mean quote unquote it probably wasn't as dangerous as people think, but I, I can imagine some, you know, very traditional Japanese parents growing up in a you know a countryside town of, you know, uh, Japan and now their daughter, the oldest one of of course, right? Oh, I'm taking off to Bosnia <laughs> to go I mean, to to Croatia to go help Bosnian refugees in one of the you know worst wars in Europe. Or it wasn't even a war; it was basically a genocide, right? In Europe for the last you know thirty years. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. That's pretty crazy. But so your parents have always supported you to pursue like your passions. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so 
So when you went, so now you're leaving, um, what was it, Kofu, and you're going to Tokyo. What was it like your first time, like, you know, a, a young college student, now you're in Tokyo. What was what was that like? Well, uh, as, as supportive as my parents were, they, they were also conservative, and I really couldn't do much uh, like other uh Activities? I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, uh, yeah, like, it, uh, you, 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 dating was that, like, you know, very hard for, for me Even to though do. you were outside of the no, no, other no. home? I mean, when I was doing Well, yeah, when you were there, yeah, yeah. House, okay. right? so, so now you're now free. I'm free. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, of course I explored. And, yeah. Um, kind of um, just... Yeah, the freedom, right? And yeah. then being, the, but the freedom comes with the responsibility. Yeah, hundred yeah, um, percent. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes kids don't know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. So uh, what I did is that um, my parents, luckily, my parents pay for the tuitions, but that I decided to pay my own living expense okay. and get also a student loan, in which I later later on I pay back. Uh, I mean, pay off myself. But anyways, um, so I work part time as a uh, tutor for the students, or maybe the uh, I'm the instructor at um, some uh, um, prep school. There's a uh, in Japan. There's a, a school called the prep school uh -huh. for the high school students to just go, just um, getting a really supportive. Um, uh, classes in order to prepare to get into the good college like college prep yeah the college prep course maybe okay. yeah. yeah so okay. i i taught uh to in those kind of schools so that was my part-time job and then when I, you were in college and when i was in college yeah okay. so i'm a full-time student and then i work part-time and then also um save some money uh, so that I can actually travel around the okay. world. Yeah. So as a, as a as a college student, I didn't do any luxury vacation right. trip, but that I wanted to kind of uh, do backpacking trip to yeah. Asia and Europe, and um, and I went to India also. And then one summer, I wanted to improve my English, so I took uh, English language school uh, ELS okay. program in uh, in the United States. Okay. So I've been kind of a travel around yeah. and uh, get a lot of experience. So those dreams when you were a little girl staring at the mountains finally started mm -hmm, to come true. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't just leave to Tokyo. You started leaving, leaving all over the, the world. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing the culture, different. Uh, yeah. So seeing the different country really opens your eye. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. And to the different culture and a different perspective mm -hmm. and maybe the language that, mm -hmm. that they speak and then of course um i took english class from middle school to high school okay. but the uh you, you it doesn't it doesn't get really good <laughs> yeah unless you practice it yeah unless you're forced um, into an environment it, where you mm -hmm. have to do it right? yeah so that was one of my um primary um goals mm -hmm. um to accomplish like okay i really need to be um become fluent so i yes. can communi c communicate with the people and then be able to um yeah just to get around uh, yeah. also you need that you need you need to be able to communicate and then also um understand what not just what they're saying in like uh, w while traveling, but that the really communicating and understanding the differences, and um, yeah, so the traveling helped me to uh, improve my English language skills as well as to prepare myself for. I would say the next step of my life, what I, what I do after college. Yeah, that's big. I mean, because most people don't get to travel. I mean, my first travel outside of the country was 19 years old and we went to Europe. I was a chaperone for my sister's high school because she was in advanced placement courses. And we went to England, Flan uh, I England, France and Italy. And it was like, uh, you know, it was London, Paris, Fl Venice, Venice, Florence, Siena and Rome. 
And after that trip, like my mind was just stretched beyond belief, you know, yeah. all these little problems that I thought I had in San Jose seemed so in in insignificant, you know, I just realized it was just this huge world out there. And ever since then, I was just like, I just love to travel, you know. So what was your first big trip outside of Japan when you when you got to college? What was the first trip that, that you went to outside of the outside of the country? I, actually, my first trip to the to overseas was in the United States. I oh. went to um, So here, here was here. Yeah, oh, here okay. the first time. Um well, where would you took, go? I took a English language class in a Seattle University in Washington. Okay. Yeah. Washington. Okay, mm -hmm. Seattle, Washington. Yeah. So what was that like? <laughs> it was it was interesting. Uh, it was just a summer session. I took um, one month English class, and then I, I was able. To, uh, so during that time, I was staying in the dormitory of the Seattle yeah. University, and it's my first time. I really didn't really uh, speak good English that time. Um, they uh, put us in an assessment test, and then kind of a. Uh, place me into the uh, in, in the level of the class that I'm at yeah, and right. then I was like uh, out of like a level one to level six well six being the, the highest level yeah. of that uh, the program for foreign student I was placed at the level five okay. so um, after finishing up the level six you are able to actually transfer to the community college if you want to okay. so I, I was kind of that level um, yeah, but that I got homesick really bad. Oh, badly. really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, nowadays, you can find the Japanese restaurants all over the place. Yeah. But, you know, that, now it's this like, is like you know, one of the most popular. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's like a 20 years, more than 20 years ago. So that was, yeah, there, there wasn't too many uh, Japanese restaurants or sushi restaurants available. Yeah. And then I missed, missed my food. Um, but Especially in Washington, I'm sure at that time. Yeah, the Seattle. There's actually a lot of Japanese American populations in, in oh, Seattle. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a the grocery stores and everything, but um, basically, no, I didn't really care about being with other Japanese. I wanted to be with uh, non-Japanese, yeah. so that uh, or the the friends from other countries. Right. Like uh, I made a friends, uh, made a friends. Um, the, the person from Mexico, I remember, uh, the person from Italy or Hong Kong. So there was a lot of international mm -hmm, students there. A lot of okay. International student. It was a really fun time. Yeah. To get I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. All these people from all over the world uh -huh. coming to the U.S. to, to learn English yes. and see the the country for the first time. Exactly. So I tried to hang out with them as much as possible. Yeah. Even a short time, and after that, uh, completing that program, just a one month. I right. had to stay at um, one of my friends who are from Seattle, actually American friend from Seattle. She invited me to homestay at her place for another month. So I get hung out with her and she just took me around everywhere she goes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So you actually beautiful. got to see Seattle from Seattle. someone who lives there. Mm -hmm. And then not just being an exchange student or international student at the at the school, I get to experience maybe just, you know, daily life w with her um, and going to shopping, going to movie, um, going to the concert or... Was the Space Needle around back then? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so yeah. did you get to see mm -hmm. that? I did. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I believe it was late Ju July or August, there's a sea fair. It's a, one of the major carnivals in the seattle oh, wow. where like a blue angel will fly in the sky <laughs> and it was like my first time i've seen those Man. things like oh, so what was that cool. like yeah super cool <laughs> yeah right? it was super cool yeah so then um you got to spend about two months in the united mm -hmm. states and you go back to tokyo mm -hmm. what was your next trip after that so so that was my sophomore year and then junior year mm, i went to india <laughs> yeah. Wow! Yeah. What a completely opposite contrast from the United States. That's yeah. something I chose India specifically uh, to see the third world countries. Right. Uh, and there's just so many countries in the third world, but India's uh, are well known as one of the most difficult countries to travel uh, uh -huh. around, and then. Uh, People say you either really like India or dislike India once right. you get there. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's very hot and yeah. it's really noisy and busy and then really chaotic and yeah. then, uh, the streets are not so clean and right. it's just uh, a lot of um a lot of homeless people right uh poverty. which which part of india did you I go to i traveled uh from new delhi to um northern northern part of india oh northern part okay mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. then i, I just kind of did the touristic things like yeah. i went to the agra uh jaipur and then varanasi where you see the the river of ganga like a uh the famous river yeah. where people bathe and then oh, they yeah. the cremate and then they throw the ash and everything it's yeah. like everything in the in, in the water. river yeah. wow yeah. that's yeah. must it's a cu- <laughs> cultural shock yeah and also shocking to see the really absolute poverty i mean i never really seen that before yeah um or maybe suffering i would right. say yeah. yeah yeah so that so what did those two um adventures or travels what did that do for you when you finally got back to japan like how did that put things into I, perspective for you i really really appreciated that how clean <laughs> yeah the country is like um the sunny the sense of like idea of sanitation is just so so different um Mm -hmm. i i get really sick in india as well just Mm -hmm. from drinking water or i i was very careful but i still got really sick from the maybe drinking water or uh eating food local food um it's a lot of new bacteria germs just stuff that you had never experienced before yeah Uh, um and how to well basically i was there as a foreign tourist status right yeah, so yeah. they tried to uh kind of a uh you know how to how to how to uh okay here's a i i went with my uh female friend from college right so two japanese young females okay. from japan not not knowing anything about traveling in india yeah <laughs> th- th- yeah they are they're really trying to advantage taking advantage yeah. of us you know how to how to get the money out of us right? yeah. <laughs> oh yeah that t- costs this much and it's like triple right <laughs> yeah so how to navigate those you know yeah. uh trouble culture in india is uh, just a quickly learn you know we had to click quickly learn uh, how to handle those um the people who are trying to get uh how to say um take advantage of you mm-hmm, get money out of you mm-hmm. yeah yeah and then how to handle when somebody just come to st- stick a hand yeah big money beggars, beggars or beggars. Yeah, yeah stuff like that yeah, yeah. Um, well, you can't just give them money. I mean, that might help something, but that it's really doesn't really solve any big problem. So right. I kind of decided not to do that much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I just took it as a one big experience um, out, of, out of many. And... Um, yeah, put me in a perspective, like how unique, like each country or each culture has. And then you happen to be born in that country. It's not, it wasn't your choice. You know, the the fact that I happened to be born in Japan, it wasn't my choice. Right. But, uh, by sort of coincidental, I don't know. I could have been born in India. I could have been born in Africa. I could have been born in the United States. So... Now I look back, I uh, feel like eventually you get to the point that, that it, to th- you get to the point of life that, that it, you have to think about what is the purpose of your life? Like, uh, what do you really do in your life? Okay, so I was born in Japan. I was given proper education, and I was fortunate enough to travel to see those reality of the world and what can I use those experience? How can I use those experience to, or make myself useful for, you know, for, for others or for, for society or Mm -hmm. I, I always think about like, you know, yeah, it's just life is so unfair in a way. So you kind of, uh, 
got a new sense of gratitude and appreciation for where mm -hmm. where you grew up yeah. and you saw it differently yeah but i think that also kind of made you want to help where you could is that correct mm -hmm. yeah so i think that someone like me or people who grew up in the you know wealthy nations have a lot of resources and then right. i thought that it's there's a so many way to um re redistribute in a way redistribute the wealth to those who are un, uh, not, as fortunate. not as fortunate or maybe uh, for those who have no resources to um, help themselves right. yet. So uh, it's not like a just giving away the money, but mm -hmm. there's a way to um, help develop the system maybe mm -hmm. or maybe help... Um, so that that's what the a lot of a government assistant program or right. profit assistant program would do. So again, uh, all my experience are sort of you know helped me to revert my thinking to back to what I want to do for my career, and yeah. it's always come back to, yeah, I want to do something to help out people. Yeah. So all those experiences basically made you basically made you appreciate you know, growing up in Japan and you wanted to, to help. And I, I like how you said, it's not just about giving the money cause that's not going to do much, but what those organizations do like nonprofits or stuff like that, they, they maybe try to fix the systems that are broken in those countries or teach people how to somewhat help themselves. Is that, is that kind of mm -hmm. the way it was? Mm -hmm. And it's funny how you mentioned, um, Japan and India cause you know, Japan is still known as maybe the cleanest you know, safest, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. most well put together country in the world. And I actually do want to go to Japan because, you know, I just I just spent two months in Hawaii and Hawaii mm -hmm. is like, a you know, eight hours or whatever. Real, real close plane flight to Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's probably where we, we will be going or I'll be going in the future, very near future. Right. But I just heard Japan is just like the cleanest, the safest. Like you could leave your phone in the middle of the street and they'll just pick it up for you or they'll leave it there. No one will touch <laughs> it. You know what I mean? Um, so. I mean, you know, now you're out, you've seen the world, um, you've seen, you know, the refugees from Bosnia, you went to India and saw, you know, mm -hmm. true poverty and, you know, a, a very populated, just crazy, you know, uh, a lot of good, but also a lot of, a lot of, you know, things that were shocking to you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So now you get back and, and what happens after all your travels? Uh, did you finish school? Like Yeah, I finished the school. I graduated from Waseda University in Tokyo and um, I um, decided to um, take a position offered by the nonprofit organization based okay. in Tokyo and they decided me sent to uh, they decided sent me to the project in Cambodia, so oh, I <laughs> another, another uh, war torn, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this organization, uh, or the actually the same nonprofit that I volunteered during the during the college years. Okay. So they knew me, and they know that I traveled to Bosnia, and then a, a they they actually think that that I can be. Uh, managing some of the program that they are doing in Asia or African countries. So wow. I was assigned um, a mission in Cambodia where they are providing vocational training program for uh, handicapped people. Okay. Uh, basically, you know, you know, the landmines, a lot yeah. of landmines are the buried in, mm -hmm, yes. in, in Cambodia. So a lot of people lost their legs and arms and, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Like it's still happening. Like yeah, they're they're still. It's impossible to get uh, all landmines out. Yeah. It's yeah. still there, uh, and as as careful as they are, and the farmers and, and working mm -hmm. in the countryside, they still have some impact. And um, right. yeah, once you get a handicap like that, it's the Cambodia is one of the poorest countries in the world. There's no resources for the government. Right. Or to help out those people, uh -huh. so where that's where n nonprofit or UN program come into play to okay. help them out. What were you guys doing for those people? So we had we're running the vocational training school, um, so we accept like uh, 30, 40, 50 students at the time, and then teach them. We hired the local teachers to um, 
so that the student can uh, develop their skills of like repairing a motorbike or okay. um, yeah, back in those days, like a, repairing a radio yeah. or you know, stuff like that. And then for women, sewing skills. Yeah. Um, so that after graduating from the school, they can be, become some be, become more financially independent right. by okay. using those skills. So you were giving them, these are like poor farmers or people from the countryside mm -hmm. and you would give them actual skills so they can yeah. make money and earn a living mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. So I was basically, uh, I wasn't teaching them directly, but that right. I was managing that program. So like you were I'm putting it together, putting it together, coordinating and, yeah. um, you know, the, putting the financial, um, uh, yeah, the, the numbers, together. numbers together. Mm -hmm. So you were in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. How long did uh, you spend? Uh, one, one year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. wow. So, so <laughs> you've been all over. So, uh, so after that, that, that year in Cambodia, what did you do next? So, uh, while in Cambodia, um, while I was running the program, I was also able to, uh, have some experience working together with the local government because whenever the nonprofit going to do some project, you have to have kind of a coordinate with the local government and uh, have their support maybe because the government also, um, the the foreign nonprofit is a really important valuable resources for them, yeah. so we always work together, local authorities. And sometimes we need a permissions or uh, some, yeah, the, it's inevitable, inevitable to work together, having okay. good relationships. So well, it's important. Yeah. yeah, it's very important. And so I was sort of um, uh, kind of new face in that field, yeah. but that I, I, uh, I was probably better uh, with talking and negotiating with those people more than to, to other my colleagues <laughs> in organization why do you think that was i guess that i think they are too quiet my colleagues okay. are a little too quiet and then and you need to kind of speak up when you yeah. know and, and then also i learned to work with the uh, other non-profit organization working in the same field yeah. like uh, we weren't the only one working or to help out the people uh, in landmine or uh, handicapped, handicapped people. So there's other foreign organization from European countries or United States and maybe UN people to come and work together. There's like a big foreign community there. Okay. So I work with them and that, it, that was a really wonderful experience for me, but it made me realize that, the, well, I, I really need to, um, they, the, 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 staff members from other organizations are highly educated like well they all have like a master degrees or a phd or they're they're professional and then i felt like i was just so you know just out of college and then i have no much working experience so okay i better to at least have a master master degrees so my next focus was to okay i want to get a master degrees of uh maybe international relations or something like that from uh, accredited U.S. University, so that was my next uh, goal, next step. Yeah, yeah, except so. So you left Cambodia, and where did you go? And to? then I went back to Japan for a couple of years to save money. And mm -hmm. while in Japan for two years, I worked for. Uh, I had opportunities to work for the politicians. Actually, Japanese politician mm. is like a equivalent to the congressman here. Um, as a like a political researcher, okay. so I get to have a little bit of a uh, experience of working in a national level of politics, and then I thought, hmm, you know, the politic politics is just impacting so much of the people's life too. Yeah. So uh, helping out poor people or people in need, bottom up, is very important. But actually, the policy making may be very important to make a big impact on people's lives. So right. I decided to take political science uh, class and degree in the United States. Oh. So during those so two years, major. well, not quite ma big major. It's it, for me, it's yeah. it's a uh, it's connected. Okay. So yeah, kind of similar. similar. So, yeah. I just wanted to have a different approach. Maybe um, it's okay to work for the nonprofit in the future, but that are also important to, to know 
how politics works, how the registration prep, yeah, uh, how the registration process works, and then how actually they they are lawmakers, right? How they make a law. <laughs> so um, I save up some money to go to the graduate school, and then I moved to the United States. And where did you where did you move to? I moved to the California. I went to the uh, California State University, Chico. Oh, Chico. Okay. Yeah. So you went to a small town in California. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, 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 I wanted to go to the UC Berkeley. That was my uh-huh. sort of dream school. But I, while in Cambodia, I met a guy, okay. uh, American. Okay. And, uh, and pretty soon, actually, I was proposed and then I, I got married. Oh, so you met so your, your ex was already there. Yeah, yeah, so I... By the time I went back to Japan, we were married, and then we kind of planned out our life together. Okay. And I wanted to go back to graduate school, and then he also wanted to go back, go back to the graduate school. So how we did it all together, right. uh, it's a really... Was he from Chico? Yes, yeah, so, so that's where he graduated. Um, oh, that's no, where he was going to school. Yeah, that's where he went to school uh, uh, bach- and got a bachelor degree. So it was easier for him to go back to his uh, where he where he got a degree rather than trying to get in a Berkeley. That's yeah. really impossible for him. Like not impossible, but that it was very difficult. A lot harder. Harder. From, from Chico, yeah. Yeah. So okay, uh, it wasn't my ideal uh, situation, but. I kind of compromised, and so then you, I you compromise for for love for for your, for, uh, for your the relationship and marriage relationship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but at least you know, for me, it was my uh, my purpose was getting a master degree of political science. Um, it wasn't maybe the uh, the best university to go to to. Um, yeah, but then you know, it, it it was it was good. I at least it provided me with enough knowledge and and uh, coursework and um, thesis that I worked on. It's all benefited me to get a degrees to move on to the next level. Yeah. So it was really good. Thank you for tuning in. That was the end of part one. Part two comes out next Monday, 9 a.m. Please stay tuned. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so that YouTube will let you know when the next one comes out.